So we have already seen a little bit about isogenies and how they're defined. Um, so here I'm repeating the definition again, now giving some words of some uh, math symbols to the pieces we're seeing. So we have an isogeny is a group homomorphism, so taking an elliptic curve as a group, and it's a map from one curve to the other where this map is given by rational functions. So that means, well, you have a fraction of polynomials, so there are finitely many elements where the denominator vanishes, and so that is, well, those points are the kernel, and also the point of infinities, of course, on the kernel. Kernel means the elements that land on the point of infinity. And then we had to find the degree of an isogeny to be the size of the kernel. And so here I'm giving D as a name because I will need this in the next part. And there's also a grayed out part saying separable. So all the isogenies we are going to see in this lecture are separable isogenies. You can define some over finite fields. Well, we're looking into finite fields which are using the Frobenius and then they're inseparable. But we are looking only at separable isogenies. So you can really just count the number of points in the kernel to get the uh, degree of the isogeny. Now, one interesting thing is when you're looking at an isogeny from E to E prime, then there always exists one isogeny to go back. Um, this is unique um, when we're assuming that we're looking at everything modulo isomorphisms. So you have, of course, many isomorphisms running around that you can also run after this. But up to that, this uh, maps are unique. And when you first go from e to e prime using phi, and then go from e prime to e using phi hat, so the dual isogeny, then what you've done on the curve e is a multiplication by d map. So the kernel is some group of size d, and that's the same d that um, defines this, this dual isogeny. So you're going from here to e prime and back to e and what you've multiplied by is d. So you've taken each point d times itself. And well, if this was a point of order d, then it gets mapped to infinity. Of course it gets mapped to infinity because it mapped from here to infinity already phi. And the infinity maps to infinity because phi hat is also a group homomorphism or anything that is a point of order d on phi hat gets also mapped to um, infinity on e. And of course you can also do it the other way around. You start on e prime, go to e, and then you go back from e to e prime with this e. So then you have also the multiplication by d map on this curve e prime. Okay, so finally um, we're now looking for at maps that come from a curve to itself. So we're looking at isogenies. From a curve to itself, and such maps are called endomorphisms. Now, when you have ordered isogenies, you can compose them with addition because, well, each isogeny operates for points, so you can define the sum of two isogenies from E to E prime by taking the sum of the images. So, so you have phi and psi, and you're taking phi plus psi, it just means you're taking the images and you're adding them there. Now, if you're mapping from E to itself, you also have composition because you're going from E to itself, to itself, to itself. And then under these two operations, so addition and composition, the set of endomorphisms forms a ring. So this ring is called the endomorphism ring of the curve. And sometimes we will highlight that this endomorphism ring, we're only looking at endomorphisms defined over certain field K. So then we're talking about the K, uh, the ring of K rational endomorphisms. And so then the end gets a little subscript k. Now we're going to look at finite fields in this course because we want to do cryptography so we typically want to deal with these finite objects and so we'll look at finite fields q and q is some prime the power of a prime p. So first of all this means there are only finitely many pairs of x and y. Well I mean if you're looking at the curve equation say short Weierstrass form, so you have y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and then for each x that you plug in, well, there exists at most two y's, namely plus y and minus y, so even if you would be looking at all q squared pairs, that's still finitely many, and don't forget the point of infinity. So the Hass interval is capturing actually where this number of points is living. 
And the idea that each Q can give a point plus has a point infinity is actually pretty good to understand the center of the Hausa interval, but then it also goes somewhat smaller, so it can be as low as Q plus 1 minus 2 square root of Q and as high as Q plus 1 plus 2 square root of Q, but not outside. So the number of points on the curve over a finite field if Q is always inside this interval. All right, and so then if I give you now a definition of what it means for a curve to be super singular, so that's different from singular. Singular we had in the first lecture where I explained the certain um, Jacobi criterion and cusps and nodes. Super singular curves, those are elliptic curves, but they have very special properties. So one way to define them is that the number of points when you write this well as a number in the Hass interval, so it's of the form q plus 1 minus t for some t, then for a super singular curve, this t is congruent to 0 modulo p. Or you could also equivalently say that the set of points of order p, so p is the characteristic of this finite field, that that one is just infinity. Now what we had seen already is that for um, random prime, uh, for primes which are not the characteristics, so if you're looking at the um, L torsion points, so the set, or well, here the N torsion points, so the set of points on the curve, and note this is over an algebra closure, so it's fp bar here, then it's a set of points over fp bar for which n times p is a point of infinity. So these are points of order n or dividing n. So when I write e of n, or in this case e of p, that is not just a statement over the field that we're looking at, but it's over the field and any of its extension fields. And then what it says here, if you're looking for points of order p, then that is an empty set. So well, the only point which has order dividing p is a neutral element which well has just order 1. There is a third definition which is also equivalent, namely that the endomorphism ring is uh, an order in a quaternion algebra, but we're not going to do much with that, and so I'm leaving that part open to show you something else, namely what can we say about the number of points if we're looking over a sufficiently large field. So in cryptography, we typically want fields where the prime is larger than 3, and then the criterion that p is congruent to 0 modulo p, and that the number is in the Hassan interval, if you're just looking um, for prime fields, then 2 times square root of p is actually less than p. So the only value t, which is making this curve have the right number of points in the Hassan interval, that is congruent to 0 mod p is actually t being exactly 0. So that means that the number of points of p on the super singular curve is p plus 1. But if you're allowing yourself a quadratic extension field, then things are a little bit more interesting. Then you'll also see curves with p minus 1 squared, p plus 1 squared, or in the middle, the same case as now, so t equals 0. So that means p squared plus 1. But still, for large primes, so when we're looking at fp or fp squared, then those are the only three orders that can appear. Okay. Another thing that we need is the notion of a quadratic twist. We have already seen isomorphisms of curves, so those were maps from a curve to another curve, which didn't have exceptions. So isogenies are allowing for exceptions, isomorphisms, have kernel just being the neutral element. And now a twist of a curve is a curve which is isomorphic to the original curve, but over an algebraic closure. So we have a curve which is defined over k, say e is defined over k, e prime is also defined over k, but the isomorphism is not necessarily defined over k, but over some extension. So let's look at these curves here. So we have some e given there, well, this looks like the Montgomery form. And then we have an e prime, where the only change from e to e prime is that there's now a minus sign in front of the y squared. And so that means that we are changing, well, if you have a valid point on e, and you want to map it to a valid point on e prime, then you map it to, well, x, y maps to x comma square root of minus 1, y. 
And I'm specifying now that this curvature is over at p, where p is common to pre mod 4, and that means that square root of minus 1 is not defined over at p, but over at p squared. So that means this map that I wrote down here is only defined over a quadratic expansion field, and that's why we call such a twist a quadratic twist. You can also have a cubic twist or a sextic twist, so that defines which extension field the twist lives in. So after which these curves become isometric. Now you might go like F, nice, but this thing is not even a Weierstrass curve. So how can we get this back to the shape that we're expecting? So we can always do some extra composition with some isomorphisms. So let's move it to something which looks more normal. So let's move the minus y. Um, let's move the minus sign from the y away. So for instance, if we map from xy to minus xy, then all the odd terms get an extra minus sign, but the even degree term, the x squared, does not. And so if we then divide those sides by minus 1, well, we're getting rid of the minus 1 in front of the y squared, that was the whole purpose. We're getting rid of the minus 1 in front of the x cubed and in front of the x, but instead of the ax squared, we're now getting minus ax squared. And this is now a totally valid curve. So here we have a quadratic twist of the original curve. So this E double prime has um, the normal Weierstrass form. And um, here we have the sequence of these two maps that goes from E to E double prime with an extension field of degree t. Now let's concentrate on E and E prime to learn something about the number of points. So when you plug in some x coordinate for the E curve, then, well, it can happen that x cubed plus a squared plus x is actually a square. And that means you're getting two points on E over fp. So, well, so you compute the square root, and then you take plus or minus that, and you get in two points. I should say this, I mean, it's a non-zero square, else this would be just one point. It can also be that it's not a square. And now we're in the case of 3 mod 4, and we know that minus, the square root of minus 1 is well, not defined over this field. So taking a non-square and multiplying it by minus 1 means we're getting a square. So then the negative of that value is actually a square. And so we're actually finding a point or a pair of points on E prime. And then the third possibility is that we're getting 0 on the right-hand side. And that means x, 0 is a point on E as well as on E prime. All right, so let's recap this. In the first case, we're getting two points on E. In the second case, we're getting two points on E prime. And in the third case, we're getting one point here and one point there. So that means each x coordinate gives rise to exactly two points if we combine these two curves. And then, of course, each of these curves also has the point infinity. So the sum of the orders is 2p plus 2. And so if we write the order of the two, curve, so the order of E, as P plus 1 minus T, then the order of the twist is P plus 1 plus T. So this is another property of a quadratic twist, that you know something about the order. If you write the curve as P plus 1 minus T, then the twist has P plus 1 plus T. Okay, we're getting some step closer to defining the main uh, players of this of this lecture. So we have already talked about isogenies. Um, now how can we actually get such an isogeny? We've so far seen just an example in the talk, we've seen examples on the exercise sheets, but here is the general way how we find isogenies. We define or we pick a subgroup of E and then up to isomorphism there's a unique separable isogeny which is defined by having exactly this subgroup G as its kernel. So this E prime is isogenous to E, and well, to highlight the dependence on this subgroup G, we normally write this as E slash G. So this is kind of reminiscent of quotient groups, but it's, well, it's a map to a different curve. And unlike quotient groups, this resulting curve is actually having the same number of points. So over FQ, we'll still find the same points, or over any k that these curves are isogenous. Now, more definition, so if the subgroup is defined over k, then both the map and the resulting curve are also defined over k. 
And the way that we compute this um, is due to Lelui from 1971, where he shows how to do this explicitly. So he takes the points in the subgroup and then in well, the complexity is roughly the number of points. Um, for each point he does something and that allows him to compute the isogeny and also to evaluate the isogeny at points. So he can push a point from E to E prime through the isogeny. But this costs L steps for a group of order L. So that means we can only do this efficiently for small degrees. Also, the formulas operate in the field not where G is defined. So you can have a group G, which is Galois invariant. So that means the group is defined over FK, but the points are actually uh, well, FQ. <laughs> Sorry, the points might live over extension field. And so what we do want is that these extension fields that we encounter stay small. Now, one of the things why I'm highlighting Seaside here as an example is that Seaside gained momentum because we had a nice way to pick a special uh, curve so that we can get all our subgroups over the base field. So we're picking a very special P and we're picking super singular curves which have exactly these P plus one points. So we're taking super singular curves over FP and we have just seen the previous slide that those have P plus one points. And something I already said at the beginning of the slide, if you're looking at the points over in the isogenous curve, this E over G, then not all of the points over K are actually images of K rational points on the original curve. I mean, if you have, say, 18 points here and you have a degree 2 isogeny, that means, well, two points on your kernel. So if this was a kind of quotient group, then you would expect only nine elements over here. But actually, the isogenous curve has the same number of points. So over the same field, both these curves have the same number of points. And actually, that's a criterion. Two curves are over, F, over K are isogenous if and only if they have the same number of points. So then there is isogeny, you just might not be able to find it. It might have a too large degree to write it down or it might be hard to find. So where do these other points come from? Well, they come from, well, they still come from over here, but the points live in extension fields. So here we go. I promised you various formulas. Here they are. So we have now a specific subgroup in mind, namely I'm picking one point of a prime order and I just want to look at groups G, which are generated by such a point P. So this is simplifying it. Normally you would have these products or sums over all elements in this group. But if I'm just looking at, well, a subgroup generated by a single point, then I also know what the order of this point is. Let's call this L and I'm using a curve EA while well, you can see um, down here that this is starting point. So this A um, is, the core, uh, is the one coefficient of the Montgomery curve. And then, well, each xi, that means it's the x coordinate when you compute i times p. So you're taking p plus p plus p, right? i copies. And then that's a point xi, yi, but we only need the x coordinate of it. So here, this is just the constant using all the xi's. This is just the constant using all the xi's. And this f of x, that's the isogeny, or that's the, well, the polynomial, the part of the polynomial which gives the isogeny. This x here is the variable x, and the, here are the coefficients coming in. Now, a nice feature of Montgomery curves is that we can do essentially everything just with x coordinates. So the y-coordinate looks kind of ugly because we need to compute the derivative of this function. There's an extra coefficient coming in, which means it's computed square root. But if we only need to look at x, that's much nicer. And also the formula for getting the Montgomery coefficient b of the isogenous curve is this simple expression. So we're taking the coefficient of the original curve. And then this is the sigma, this is the tor that goes in here. And we can also save a factor of 2 in the computation because we do know that if you compute i times p and minus i times p, then both of them have the same x value and the y value has the opposite sign. 
If you're interested in the implementation, there's a lot of tricks that go in there. For instance, you can use projective formulas instead of having the 1 over xi here and there. You can kind of delay all these inversions and working with fractions. So, or mathematically speaking, you homogenize the uh, equations and work with projective coordinates. And then at the very end, you do one inversion, which typically is cheaper. So this is all you need to do in order to figure out how to compute an isogeny. So when you look at the exercise sheet or the, the third lecture, there were some examples. And so, well, I picked a point of order two, and then, well, here you just get what the form is of. Now, cheating a little bit because this is the Montgomery formulas, I gave you Weierstrass curves, but the Weierstrass formulas look the same. We're actually using Montgomery curves for the seaside example. And here, now, this was the slide at the beginning of the seaside in one slide. Now this makes a lot more sense. And I also put labels there. So each EI, or EA I should say, so this subscript there, that corresponds to this Montgomery coefficient here. So up here we have the curve y squared x equals x cubed plus x. And if you look at how this works, you can actually prove for yourself that for p congruent to free mod 4, this has exactly p plus, uh, p plus 1 points, so that's a super singular curve. And that is the case over any field where p is congruent to free mod 4. And okay, sanity check 419, yes, that's congruent to free mod 4. And then each blue line is a 3 isogeny. And so we now see that if we take a 3 isogeny from E0, then we get, well, either this one or that one. So what does it actually mean to go in this direction or that direction? So the counterclockwise one is actually the three isogeny. So when we compute a three isogeny, we're landing at E158, 410, etc. And then you also have the five and seven isogenies. Now, what you also observe is when we look at these numbers, say 410 here, and then the same distance to the right, we have uh, 9. 410 plus 9 is exactly the 419. Or down here, 390 plus 29. 199 plus 220. So there's always EA this way and E minus A that way. Well, taking mod 419. And that's how we can compute positive direction and negative direction. So this is E 3 isogeny the way we would compute it. And this would be the dual to it. Or we can also do this by flipping to the twist of the curve. Well, we can easily go from, say, E410 to E9 by just saying, hey, well, now my E, my A coefficient has changed its sign. Then we find a point of order 3 using the loose formulas. And we apply a positive direction 3 isogeny to get to E261. And then we flip back, and so now we are at E158. And so we've just done one step on the free isogeny in the negative direction. So this is one way of seeing the negative direction, or you can see it via the dual of an isogeny. Okay, now things get even more mathematical. If this was already too much, this is a good moment to pause. The rest is mostly for those of you who really want to understand what's going on. To motivate why you maybe do want to listen to this, um, we will talk about composing uh, all these isogenies. So I will talk about having a 3 to the 5, five uh, 7 to the 17 or something isogeny from the first curve. But then I will be showing you this graph again and I'll be walking around the steps. And then you might go like, wait a second, this is a 3 isogeny from E0 to E was 158. That's all right. But then it's a free isogeny from this curve and no longer from the original curve. Now what is actually happening is that we are not having uh, the isogenies operate on the elliptic curves, but we have um, the class group operating. So we have this endomorphism ring of the original curve and the correspondence to the Li, which are the isogenies, is that we're having elements from this class group operating there. And so the isomorphism, uh, endomorphism ring from all the curves that we're looking at, namely these curves, 
of this shape, no mice or anything else here, just there's an A coefficient here. And having p plus one point, those are exactly determined by having an amorphism ring z adjoint square root of minus p. If you change anything, you stick with super singular p plus one points, but you're allowing a different shape, then you also get z adjoint square root of minus p, and then plus one over two. Well, for this one, this is all. And then inside um, this class group, or inside uh, this order, then you can ask yourself, what is an ideal above such a prime error? And then you're going to find two possibilities, one which is written here, so this is definitely above mi, and the pi is a Frobenius. And then what you're seeing here, pi minus 1, now that means that pi operates as the identity. And that means this is the action for Frobenius, well, where it doesn't do anything, that means over fp. So these are points over fp, and then operating as mi. And so moving in the plus direction on the set of curves with an Li isogeny. And now we're actually getting something which composes over the elliptic curves. So it's an action on the set of curves and no longer an action on the, well, not longer an isogeny on the original curve. Then we have an action of these elements from the endomorphism ring. So this math track Li um, is the proper thing that actually is operating on it. And then the negative direction Okay, here's the, the precise definition that I actually just ran through. Um, so the subgroup corresponding to this Li is points of order Li defined over Fp. Because this Frobenius minus 1 means exactly um, the P rational, Fp rational points. So Frobenius just means we're taking um, x quadrant to the power of p, y quadrant to the power of p. So the same way that in a fine field you're having the Frobenius automorphism, on the elliptic curve, we have the Frobenius endomorphism. It maps from the curve to itself, but it's not, not always the identity. It is the identity for points over fp. And so that means we're looking at points of order Li that are defined over the base field. So that's what's written here. And then the dual isogeny, also matching the conjugate of math track Li, those are the points well, the other points um, in the L torsion group, well, it's, a, it's a basis, so the, there's two spans, and then we want to have those where the Frobenius operates by negation. And then a nice feature is for these super singular Montgomery curves that I just showed you, well, we can get those exactly from what I said, that if you have either an x column on the original curve, or you have an x, or you have a point with the x coordinate on the visual curve, or you have a point with the x coordinate on the quadratic twist. And the quadratic twist means going in the opposite direction. And so then we have that the these points are defined like this. So x and O is fp and y is not. Now with this, we have first of all that we can have this endomorphism act on the set of the curves, and all of these curves have the same endomorphism ring. And then we quotient out by trivial operations. And so that gives us the class group of this uh, order O. All right. So then we have ideal classes represented by these Li's. So L1 is some, um, so you have a prime Li, so it's normal. Uh, Li, and this is the um, ideal class living above that in the class group. So then this is the positive direction, so that is with Frobenius corresponding to the identity. I'm taking a second prime to the minus 7, so that means I'm taking the part where the Frobenius operates as minus p, and I'm taking a third prime to the 27. Now this is a big ideal, whatever the degrees of L1, L2, L3 it's to the power of 10, to the power of 7, and to the power of 27. So this looks like a really large one. So if you want to compute this in one go, as we limit, these will be very, very large formulas. But we can compute it iteratively, because we now understand how to compose these isogenies. It is not actually that we are having 10 
L1 isogenies on the first curve and then just going again and again because it's an action on the set we go into the first curve to the next curve to the next curve to the next curve and then we are restricting ourselves to uh, curves over fp and we're also restricting ourselves to isogenies over fp and that means that makes this um, class group to be commutative now i was saying before and i didn't put on the on the slide then the endomorphism is a re, uh, is an order in the quaternion algebra well that is not commutative but this is a subgroup of that or it's a sub ring of that because we're only looking at p rational elements of it and then it's commutative so this was the one big idea that we had with the c side um, to actually rescue a commutative group action and get this to work so what we're doing there is we're looking at the key space where we, we predefine sub primes l1 to n and then we're looking at the ideal classes above those primes and while we're accepting positive and negative um, exponents in some interval and i see i made a typo this last one should be en rather than n one and so this is our key space and then the set of um, elements that act on it is a subset of this class group so i understand that this was a big blast of mathematics um, you can rewind or you can just say well i'm more interested in how the scheme works so stay tuned for the next lecture which has all the operational details in it.